Thank you very much indeed, uh, Greer. Thank you to Warwick Business School. Thank you uh, to Working Capital for inviting me uh, to speak this evening. And in fact, I was fascinated to see Working Capital's uh, raison d'etre, which Greer has just, uh, has just mentioned, to encompass the approaches of the arts, creative people, and the creative sector, and apply them to the world of business to develop greater creativity and innovation in Warwick Business School teaching, learning, and research. And since I've spent my working life reporting on, among other things, the business side of the creative world, uh, it does seem a very good fit. Then when I re-looked at the title that I'd suggested, which is 40 Years of Reporting Business, I realised it actually might look a bit daunting. So I'm delighted to see it hasn't put too many people uh, off tonight, uh, and I'm delighted you're here. The reason I came up with that title is because this talk will do what it says on the tin, but uh, not only what it says on the tin. 40 years ago this week, I was preparing for my finals here at Warwick, finals in a history degree. By the end of that year, armed with that degree, I was a trainee journalist and already covering the world of business, albeit in a rather oblique way, as you'll discover in due course. Throughout the rest of my career to date, I've had the good fortune to work for a wide range of media, covering some of the most interesting stories and meeting the most interesting people, both in business and in other fields. And I've also tracked the changes in the way business is communicated to a wide range of audiences. Not that I wanted anything to do with business 40 years ago. I'd wanted to be a journalist since the age of 10, when my father lent me an old typewriter which was about to be thrown out from his office, and I produced my first newspaper. I don't know how many of you remember the old board game Scoop, but I'm not the only journalist from that era who lays the blame for their obsession uh, at the door of John Waddington Games Limited. I edited the school newspaper, and then here at Warwick I edited the student newspaper, which was then called Campus. And one of the most exciting times was when I was the news editor, and I was covering the sit-in at the registry in 1970, when students discovered the secret files that were being kept on staff members. They found the legendary note from the then Vice-Chancellor Jack Butterworth, reject this man about an American lecturer who was involved in trade union politics at the Coventry car firm then called Roots. Now for those of you too young to remember this story, Warwick had been set up with a lot of commercial backing from the car industry and other companies, hence the buildings called Roots Hall and various others. And in the left-leaning liberal university world of the late 60s and 70s, this was highly controversial, though it laid the foundations for Warwick's later eminence and success. You can read all about it in a Penguin special called Warwick University Limited, edited by E.P. Thompson, author of Make it The Making of the English Working Class, who was one of my lecturers. Amazingly, the Warwick sit-in was supported by a leading article in The Times on the subject of academic freedom, headed The House That Jack Built. As I say, like virtually all self-respecting students in those days, I wanted nothing to do with business. When my father discovered that I was about to head for the world of work and I still hadn't grown out of the notion of being a journalist, as he'd assumed I would, he recommended a list of companies for me to apply to on the milk round. And as a dutiful son, I duly sent off the application forms. He wanted me to get a proper job, not the last time that phrase uh, was said to me during my journalistic career. All very worthy companies. Um, they included Tube Investments and De La Rue, the firm which prints money literally. Uh, it makes banknotes. And thank God I didn't get accepted by any of them, because uh, I could still carry on applying for journalistic jobs, for most of which I also got rejected, but at least I did get one. There were actually some very good business courses at Warwick uh, in those days. In the jargon of the day, and it may still be the jargon uh, you will tell me, um, some of our friends were Manskis, while others were Molskis. Uh, for the uninitiated, the Manskis were studying management science, uh, and the Molskis were studying molecular science. And as far as we Eastites in the uh, School of Arts were concerned, they were all scientists. We didn't know the difference. This was also the time of the three-day week when lots of trade unions were on strike, 
and our lights would regularly go out, so we would shift from uh, Coventry to Kenilworth to Leamington, depending where the power was uh, that week. And since we had friends in all three places, uh, we were never in the dark for too, uh, for too long. But on the nine o'clock news most nights, if our TVs were working, uh, would be Warwick's Professor of Industrial Relations, Hugh Clegg, who became a national figure during all of those um, goings on. But even on the history course at Warwick, which was fantastic and much sought after in the 70s, because it sent you to America and to Venice as part of a three-year course, much to be uh, uh, envied. And I did pick up some interesting perspectives on business. As I say, E.P. Thompson was one of our celebrity lecturers, and so the role of the working class was well explored. And in Venice, we studied Renaissance history, and so could hardly avoid the link between trade and artistic achievement pioneered by the ruling families in Venice and Florence who arguably laid the foundations of the global economy in which we now live. Discuss. Now, last November, more than 20 of us held a 40th anniversary reunion in Venice, as Greer mentioned, including a reception in the wonderful Warwick Palazzo there. And I hope that in your aspiration to bring together business and the arts, Warwick Working Capital can take full advantage of the conference facilities there to inspire people to apply the approach of the arts to the business world. So, as I say, 40 years ago, after graduating, I got my first job in journalism. And as most people find when they leave university, it was not the one I would ideally have aspired to. It was on a paper called The Weekly News, which you can still buy in WH Smith, if you uh, so care to look. It's published by the canny Dundee publishers DC Thompson, who also published The Beano and The Dandy, and in the office upstairs from us, Jackie. The Weekly News is a very down-market tabloid full of showbiz and lifestyle stories. Um, so canny were they that uh, everyone got paid in cash uh, every week in a brown envelope, uh, including the London editor. I've no idea how much uh, he had in his envelope, but I'm sure it was a lot more than uh, was in mine. Uh, and these brown envelopes always came down on the same train from Dundee to London every week. So. Surprise, surprise, one day um, the brown envelopes didn't arrive. Uh, they'd been nicked. Uh, and um, I almost expected that DC Thompson would say to us, well, they left us all right, uh, but they did actually pay up. So, uh, but they were a canny company. The other thing was that the, none of the journalists got their names in the paper because they preferred to use pre fictitious names, which had the advantage that more than one writer could do pieces under that byline, and if somebody left, they could be easily replaced. So all the royal stories went under the byline Rex King, which was a Latin pun that I think was lost on the majority of weekly news readers. And when I started writing the Consumer Affairs column, which was my first journalistic brush with the business world, I did so under the soubriquet Anne Muir talks shop sense. Anne Muir, of course, was meant to sound like a canny Scottish housewife who knew how to take care of the pennies. But it caused a certain amount of difficulty when the news editor asked me to test where the five pound suit from Shopportunities, which was the bargain basement retailer of its day. The headline read, a suit for five pounds, this I had to see. Or rather it would have done if I'd been able to find a five pound one in my size. I had to settle for a £7 one, which in 1973 was still very cheap. I was ordered to wear it to work every day in the hope that it would fall apart, to my embarrassment and that of shop opportunities. And in fact, it held together remarkably well with the loss of just one button, and I reported that as such. But of course, since I was writing as Anne Muir, I had to refer to myself as a young colleague, and there were pictures of the young colleague wearing the suit both before and after the test, and they still hold pride of place in my uh, journalistic scrap scrapbook. The weekly news gave me the start I needed, but I knew I didn't want to stay there too long. And within a year, I'd moved to a trade or business paper, as we call them, called Campaign, which is the pioneering flagship of Michael Heseltine's Haymarket Publishing. It's a sign of my ignorance that I knew nothing about the trade press at that stage. I knew about national and local newspapers, of course, and consumer magazines. But this vast and highly profitable industry of business-to-business -business publications was simply unknown to me. And yet, if I had to advise any young school leaver or graduate how to get into journalism, I would recommend the business press ahead of local newspapers. These days, it's far less profitable than it was, at least in its printed form, because of the internet. 
but as a way of learning the craft of journalism and the crucial importance of specialist journalism, it is still unrivaled. And Campaign was a fantastic place to learn, and I'm sure Greer will remember this, because it covered the advertising and marketing business, which was not only highly exciting, then entering a golden period as London became the creative centre of the advertising world, but it was also a great place to learn about how business worked. All businesses advertised, and the ones that didn't, like Marks and Spencer in those days, were interesting for the very reason that they didn't advertise. Also, Campaign wasn't afraid to bite the hand that fed it, unlike many trade papers which were slavishly reverential to their own industry and saw themselves as mouthpieces for its spokespeople. In those days, Saatchi and Saatchi, Morris and Charles were growing fast, taking over other ad agencies on their inexorable rise to become the largest advertising agency in the world, at least for a while, and certainly the best known. No one except those in the know, know had then heard of Martin Sorrell, who was the financial brain behind the Sarches until he set up on his own account as WPP and became in turn the largest advertising group in the world. Here, and again this may be grist to the mill of working capital's ambitions, were business and creativity working hand in glove. Some of the greatest ad campaigns ever came out of London in the 1970s and early 80s, and I track many of them and how they worked in my book, which was published as long ago as 1982, The Complete Guide to Advertising. Now, sadly, out of print, um, long gone, but available on Amazon secondhand. And indeed, this morning, they had one new copy for £24.95, Don't All Rush. Some of the best campaigns included Hovis, Heineken, Benson and Hedges, Levi's, Audi and British Airways, with directors like Alan Parker, Ridley Scott and Hugh Hudson, who all went on to feature film success. Not to mention government campaigns such as The Pregnant Man and Road Safety and Anti-Smoking. And the British account planning system in advertising, through ad agencies such as Bose Massimi Pollitt and J. Walter Thompson, meant that advertisers could prove that their advertising was working, as recorded in the annual IPA Advertising Effectiveness Awards. In those days, the public loved advertising, and many commercials were regarded as better than the programmes. I don't think it's that way at the moment. I think uh, there's some very interesting uh, lobbying going on, trying to ban advertising for food and uh, children and all sorts of other things. But in those days, people loved advertising. And Campaign was where I learned about the media. TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, cinema, posters. This was long before the internet and also how they were funded to a greater or lesser extent by advertising and, in the case of the press, from the cover price. Again, this was long before pay TV allowed people to actually buy their television programmes. And I also learned how advertising time and space were bought and sold, how TV ratings and newspaper readership were measured, all of which stood me in very good stead for my later jobs. But it also taught me how businesses worked, income against uh, costs, profits, investment and, of course, the competition between businesses, which is so crucial. Cru crucial. And the competition part was brought home to me very forcefully when Campaign's weekly rival, Ad Week, suddenly closed, bought by our own publishers, Haymarket, and folded into our title. Our publishers and advertising sales staff were cock-a-hoop. On the editorial floor, we were gutted. Not only were journalists losing their jobs, but we would no longer have any title to measure ourselves against each week. When every story is an exclusive, what's the point in going out looking for them? And as I say, this was long before the internet when, of course, there is competition for stories everywhere and every minute. The lack of direct competition also brought down our employment value as journalists in our specialist field, since there was nowhere else to go. And that was also depressing, since Haymarket's philosophy was to take on bright graduates and not pay them very much, since there were always more where they came from. Soon afterwards, I was invited to apply for a job in PR at the then TV regulator, the Independent Broadcasting Authority. It was paying twice what I earned at Campaign, and when I was offered it, I took it. That taught me how the commercial TV and radio business was regulated. 16 separate regional ITV companies, the fledgling independent local radio, how advertising was controlled, how none of these companies could take over other companies uh, unless they uh, uh, got the approval of the regulators all of which was very useful to me when deregulation came in uh, over the next 20 years. 
But I quickly decided that I preferred journalism to PR. And after 18 months, I got the chance to return when I was invited to help launch a competitor to campaign called Marketing Week. So I left the security of a government-backed regulator for the uncertain future of a new magazine launched by a new publishing company. Uh, and it quickly felt very uncertain indeed, because as you can imagine, the publishers of Campaign wanted to keep their monopoly, because monopoly gives you more profits. Uh, and they threw everything but the kitchen sink at Marketing Week. Uh, they launched a little publication called Market Fact, uh, where they put all the classified advertising into both the monthly uh, title marketing and, and the weekly campaign in the hope that they would undercut us. Um, they uh, ran bigger and bigger issues. We were a very poor publication, I have to say, and I think they probably thought we would fold within weeks. What they didn't know was that we had actually very um, strong backers. Uh, and because I'd been on campaign, I said to the Publishers Marketing Week, you need a lot more people who really know about the industry, and they're all on campaign. Uh, so by September of that year, we had pinched five of their staff, uh, and um, suddenly we were on the road to success. Um, campaign then had to turn marketing into a weekly as well, which is a very expensive exercise. So we weren't flavor of the month at Haymarket, um, but advertisers loved it because, of course, they liked the competition between uh, Campaign and Marketing Week. But those advertisers also um, tried to have a go at us um, because we started writing stories uh, about uh, how ad agencies were upset with the sales practices of the TV companies. TV companies were about our biggest advertisers and so threatened to withdraw their advertising from Marketing Week. And for a fledgling publication, um, our publishers were very brave and they said, if you want to take your advertising away, take it away, we need to be independent. And that was a huge lesson for me about the independence of journalism being absolutely vital. That unless you can actually stand up to advertisers, unless you can stand up to the people you're writing about and say, no, we're going to uh, report on this because it's the right thing to do and our readers expect it, um, you're nowhere. And that, was a big, uh, and that was a big lesson. And of course, Marketing Week absolutely hit um, the right moment. Uh, Margaret Thatcher came into power with a Saatchi and Saatchi advertising campaign in 1979. Um, Thatcherism suddenly was all the rage. Marketing and advertising were all the rage. Saatchi and Saatchi were growing like mad. Uh, and we rose on the back of, uh, on the back of that. Uh, and it also meant that for me, I was in on the ground floor of a world which was becoming more and more important, media and marketing not just to commercial companies like Procter & Gamble and all those fast-moving consumer goods companies. Everybody started advertising. The government started privatizing all of those um, uh, big nationalized industries with huge advertising campaigns. Um, trade unions started advertising. Even Marks & Spencer started advertising. Uh, and we were there for the whole of that. Uh, and so my career was very fortunate because I rose uh, on the back of that. And as more and more people got interested in this whole area, I was able to ply my trade in more and more interesting uh, publications. Um, so in 1982, I got um, the offer you cannot refuse when Harry Evans, who was the legendary editor of the Sunday Times, um, became editor of the Times. Rupert Murdoch had taken over both titles the, uh, the year before. And Harry, ahead of the game as um, often, reckoned that media was an interesting area and needed to be covered properly. And so he asked me to join them for three days a week. Um, and as I say, it was the job offer you could not uh, refuse. There were no media sections in the papers in those days. The Guardian media page hadn't begun, um, certainly not a media section. Partly they wanted to do this because they wanted to get the job ads uh, away from the trade papers and into the national papers. So there was certainly a, com a commercial imperative there. But they knew that readers were also interested, uh, and it was one of those things that just made sense from uh, both points of view, and I was just very lucky to be uh, in on the ground floor of that. This was a time when Channel 4 was about to launch, and uh, TVAM, the first new TV channels since 1967. There were only three TV channels up to that point, uh, and they only broadcast in the evenings. Um, it was another world. Um, and so 
I was really very, very fortunate. Um, even so, the other business reporters on the Times regarded me with a huge suspicion because they thought the only true business stories involved city prices and industrial output. And in those days, that was, that was all you got in business sections. Obviously, it's changed um, a lot uh, since. Uh, and joining the Times meant I had to give up um, the salary job, the security, and go freelance. Uh, but as I say, it was an offer you couldn't refuse. Unfortunately, Harry Evans had a big bust up with Rupert Murdoch shortly after I got there. He got fired and the Murdoch accountants then went through everybody who he had appointed and um, cancelled their contracts as well. And I was on three months notice and this was a bit of a blow. Um, but just before my contract was due to expire, when the three months were up, they uh, said, oh, can you do the column next week? And I said, yes, happy to. And for the next two years, I just carried on with no notice period at all. But I was still uh, writing uh, for The Times, and it was uh, a really fascinating time. Uh, so interesting was it that The Economist um, approached me, because they liked some of the stories that I'd written for The Times, uh, in particular the cola wars between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Pepsi was running a taste test challenge at the time, which was very new, uh, and the r advertising rules had changed, so they were allowed to mention their competitors and say, uh, more people like our Pepsi taste than like Coca-Cola, and it became a big story and a big row. And um, The Economist said, could I come and do that for them as a freelance? So I was writing virtually the same stories, actually, for The Times and The Economist, which for a journalist is absolutely uh, what, you, uh, what you would really want to be doing. Then there were the lawnmower wars um, between um, Flymo and Qualcast. Do you remember a lot less bother than a hover? Uh, so that was all very exciting. And the evening newspaper wars between the London Evening Stand and the London Evening News and the butter and margarine wars. Everything was a war in those days. I mean, uh, I know it was called campaign, but this was taking it to, uh, uh, taking it to uh, extremes. But it was all about business raw in tooth and claw. And suddenly business was becoming interesting to, to the general public through the cutting edge um, of the advertising campaigns. So then, surprise, surprise, even commercial radio decided that business and advertising were a subject worth talking about. To be fair, LBC already had a really good business um, uh, coverage and business um, editor. Uh, but advertising was a way they thought they could, uh, if they had an advertising program, uh, they could get um, media directors and advertisers to listen. And so I did a drive time program uh, at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays called Advertising World. Uh, and the idea was that all these people would be driving home, which they were, and stuck in traffic, which they were, and they'd listen to me talking about all the new advertising campaigns, interviewing all the creative directors and uh, playing all the jingles and so on. And um, that worked incredibly well. And I still have people who come up to me even today and say, oh, I really loved Advertising World, used to listen to it in the car uh, going home. And it's not many programmes that have that sort of mem memorability all those, um, those years um, on. Uh, and that was the occasion on which I interviewed uh, the legendary Robert Maxwell in his private jet, no less, uh, one of the stories I like to dine out on. He was going, I got the phone call one Friday night uh, saying Robert Maxwell, who had taken over the Mirror Group of newspapers, uh, and in many ways was more far-seeing than Rupert Murdoch, though he eventually lost every battle that he fought with, with Rupert Murdoch. But the one thing that Maxwell spotted was that colour was going to be important in newspapers. And so he ordered the first colour newspaper presses uh, that would be installed in Britain. And they were made in Germany in a factory in Augsburg. Uh, and I suddenly got this phone call saying, uh, would you like to go on Robert Maxwell's jet tomorrow to take formal delivery of the colour presses? And you, again, offer you can't refuse, you said, um, yes, please. So Ray Snoddy, who was the legendary uh, media editor of The Times and The Financial Times um, at different times, uh, and I uh, reported uh, to Gatwick, and um, off, we, um, off we went. Uh, and Maxwell had this great big throne of a chair at the front of the um, private jet, which was a big jet, uh, and all his minions immediately rushed to the seats at the back of the plane to be as far away from him as possible. Whereas Ray and I wanted to be with him every moment that we could um, to um, obviously question him and have him not being able to get away from us. Uh, and there was this bench seat next to this great big throne. And so Ray and I 
sort of sat down, strapped ourselves in. And then we realised that the bench seat was actually sideways on in the plane. So we were going to take off sideways, uh, which was a most uh, unusual experience. But uh, we had Maxwell to ourselves. I was able to do a recorded radio interview for um, LBC. I had a photograph taken of me doing it, which again is pride of place in uh, one, of my, uh, uh, one of my scrapbooks. Uh, and Maxwell was a very impressive man. Um, for all that he was occasionally a laughing stock, did daft things, he spoke many languages, uh, and on this occasion he was totally in his element, striding up and down this uh, printing press factory, uh, talking about Herr Doctor this and Herr Doctor that uh, in German. Uh, and he knew what he was doing, and he was ahead of uh, Murdoch on that. Murdoch didn't order presses till years later. Um, so uh, not all bad, uh, Robert Maxwell. The other great trip I had uh, when I was on Advertising World and also writing for The Observer and a couple of other papers uh, was to Beijing, uh, where they decided they were going to have an advertising congress in the Great Hall of the People, and this was as daft as it sounds. Uh, this was the year before Tiananmen Square, and everybody in the West saw China as a huge potential market and were desperate to get in there, Heinz and uh, Pepsi, and everybody wanted to be there. And so an organization set up what they called the Third World Advertising Conference, by which they meant the Third World Advertising Conference. But because you read it as the Third World Advertising Conference, everybody was much more impressed about it than uh, thinking that this is, uh, this is a Third World Conference. And I went along to that, um, and as I say, it was in the Great Hall of the People. There were jingles for Pepsi and Coca-Cola being played out through the loudspeakers. It was a bizarre uh, uh, occurrence, uh, absolutely fascinating, lots of great interviews, and uh, I saw um, Beijing. Uh, the following year, Tiananmen Square happened, and um, China shut up shop for however many years it was until they opened up. So it was a brief glimpse uh, behind the bamboo curtain into what might be a world of uh, uh, commercial progress in uh, China, but uh, it, didn't last, um, it didn't last very long. I continued to experience the ups and downs of the business world personally. Uh, the Times dropped my advertising column eventually uh, with impeccable timing, just as The Guardian were launching uh, their media section and had realised just what a big area this was. The reason was there was a new business editor and she wanted my space for her own column. Um, such are the vagaries of, uh, of journalism and freelance journalism. But fortunately, The Independent was launching in 1986 uh, and I was asked to write an advertising column for their media page. Uh, and that, of course, was a fantastic place to be. Whopping had happened in 1986, so the print trade unions had just uh, lost their power. They had been stopping the introduction of new technology. It wasn't even very new technology but by then, but it was computer technology, uh, which meant that lots of newspapers like The Independent launched um, on much cheaper cost bases. Um, and it was a very exciting time. Uh, the Independent could have been a huge success forever. Uh, it started off brilliantly, but they got delusions of grandeur and decided they ought to launch a Sunday paper. And if they had actually just stuck to a daily paper with a very big su Saturday section, um, they would have been able to float on the stock market when it was still doing well, and the rest would have been tickety-boo. But because they launched a Sunday, um, one of the founders uh, wanted to be a newspaper editor, and so against a lot of better judgment, they launched the Sunday, in the Independent on Sunday, partly because the Sunday Correspondent uh, was another paper that had launched. Uh, it was a big mistake, um, and they really uh, never, uh, ever recovered those, uh, the, 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 those sort of heady days of the, early, um, uh, of the early Independent. But it was a great place to be, so I had this wonderful um, life. I had a column in Marketing Week, I had a program in LBC, column in The Independent, a bit of other freelance stuff, uh, and that was fine. But then the BBC um, decided long after most newspapers uh, that they needed a media correspondent. Um, and they advertised the job, they advertised for a television media correspondent, uh, one who would report for TV. I didn't apply for that because I didn't think that actually 
a media correspondent would get on TV very often, and that proved to be the case for my colleague Nick Hyam. Whereas for radio, which I absolutely love, I thought Radio 4 um, was the ideal place to be looking at some of these really big, meaty media issues. Um, they advertised the job, I got it. Uh, but I didn't realise just how much scepticism there was in the BBC about having a media correspondent uh, at all. Uh, on my first day, I was taken round the various programmes that I'd be working for. I was introduced to the producers and to the presenters. And in those days, Radio 4's PM programme was presented by Valerie Singleton, who was better known to me and to many generations of viewers as the leading presenter on Blue Peter. And she looked at me, and in her best Blue Peter tones, she said... Uh, what is a media correspondent? So I explained that it was like a, a health correspondent or an education correspondent, only it dealt with uh, the affairs of, of the media, and I said all the best newspapers have one, but I don't think she was convinced. Uh, and then I was taken to the Today programme, where I was introduced to the legendary presenter Brian Redhead, who didn't suffer anyone gladly, let alone fools, and uh, told that I was the new media correspondent. He said, oh well, I hope you get a proper job one day. <laughs> what a welcome. Well, eventually, I think even he and I think even my father uh, finally concluded my job was a proper one um, because, of course, media stories on many occasions have led the news bulletins and have held the nation enthralled or appalled. Um, in recent years, uh, for all sorts of reasons, good and bad, the media has become a major focus of attention in our society. Its doings and influence and personalities and organisations need to be covered with just the same sort of rigour and analysis and background knowledge as other parts of our society and economy. The creative industries, as the government sometimes likes to call them, have become more important in the global economy than the aerospace industry. Film, television, music, newspapers, books, the internet, advertising, marketing and all their distribution channels employ millions of people and generate billions of pounds and dollars. Add in the worlds of the arts, theatre, ballet, opera, museums, galleries and literature, and the economic impact is even greater. And of course, in cultural terms, all these activities have a huge influence affecting everyone's daily lives and the workings of government and the economy. And my job as media correspondent of BBC News cuts across many journalistic boundaries. It's part showbiz, part politics, part business, part social policy, part legal affairs, and indeed part royal, because the uh, history of the royal family in recent years has become indivisibly entwined with that of the media. And of course the whole phone hacking saga and the Leveson inquiry has added a further and sometimes unbelievable dimension to the job. Yet in my first year at the BBC, I struggled to get on the air. Nobody thought I was necessary. It was actually Rupert Murdoch who saved me, because in 1990, Sky Television was in a ruinously expensive battle with its rival British Satellite Broadcasting. Together, they were losing £14 million a week, hemorrhaging red ink, as CNN's Ted Turner colourfully put it. And privately, they agreed to merge, with Murdoch very much on top. But they hadn't asked the Independent Television Commission, which was meant to approve such deals. This was a proper story for a media correspondent. One of my great moments was pointing out to John Burt, who was then the Director General of the BBC and had been a director of London Weekend Television, that they couldn't merge because they hadn't asked permission from the Independent Television Commission. Or if they could, they would have to do it post hoc and there'd be a huge row. Uh, John Burt, to his great credit, said, oh yes. Um, so I got a brownie point there, but it was just a fascinating story uh, that just ran and ran. And of course, B Sky B has given me lots of business stories since. Uh, a few months later, Robert Maxwell fell off his yacht, uh, and at that stage my position became more secure. People really did think there was something for the media correspondent to do. Though that was an occasion my wife will never forget, or forgive him for. It was on November the 5th, the date we remember, because we were having a firework party that night. Uh, I had three young children, one a very young um, daughter, uh, and I was meant to be letting off all the fireworks, but of course I was stuck at Broadcasting House uh, covering Rupert, uh, Robert Maxwell's uh, demise. Uh, fortunately, some of our friends were able to come to the rescue, but Carol um, has never forgiven uh, Robert Maxwell for that. 
Robert Maxwell, of course, that whole story then became huge, the whole pension fund thing, what was going to happen to the mirror, and, and all of these things. Uh, but by then I was also covering salacious stories about the royals, uh, allegations of infidelity, toe-sucking, and, remember it, illicitly taped phone conversations long before the current phone hacking scandal and the corrupt payments to public officials. And because the BBC in those days preferred not to dignify these lurid tales by putting its royal correspondence on them, it gave them to the media correspondents as media stories because they could then blame them on the tacky tabloid press but still cover them none the same. Uh, and on one surreal occasion, I was on my way to the News of the World to hear the legendary, and again, this may mean nothing to the younger uh, members here, Diana Squidgygate uh, tape, which was a recording of her uh, talking to a boyfriend. Um, uh, this was long before the Prince Charles tapes and all the other tapes that later emerged. But uh, I was then rung by a BBC executive saying, I must not even listen to it, let alone report the allegations. I persuaded them that if we hadn't heard it, we'd be in no position to judge whether or not we should cover it. And, of course, everybody else was. Uh, so, eventually, I was allowed to hear it. Uh, we didn't run it um, that day or the next morning. Um, the Today programme were able to run it because they have a newspaper review, so they were able to cover it. But, of course, all of the other networks couldn't. And so those great pleading from Radio 1 and Radio 2, and when they heard that I'd heard the tape... Um, Newsbeat on Radio 1 said, well, can we interview Torin about this so that at least we've got an expert view of it? And I was allowed to be interviewed, provided I didn't tell them whether I thought it was genuine or not, um, which I thought was a bit, um, a bit of a tricky one. But anyway, once I was allowed to go on Newsbeat, then I was allowed to go on The World at One, uh, and after that, uh, it, was all, um, it was all fine. But... Uh, in those days, newspapers, you may remember, were drinking in the last chance saloon. They were facing calls for a privacy law uh, till, of course, the Heritage Secretary, David Meller, fell foul of his own tabloid revelations about his private life, uh, and all that was uh, quietly or rather noisily abandoned. But we then had the divorce of the Prince and Princess of Wales, Diana's explosive panorama interview, which the BBC kept secret from its own chairman because his wife happened to be a lady-in-waiting to the Queen and uh, they didn't think uh, he would keep it secret if they told them. Uh, we had the surreptitious photos of uh, Diana exercising in the gym. We had the fatal car crash. All of that uh, was grist uh, to the media correspondence uh, mill. And, of course, the other sensitive story I have to cover at all times is the BBC itself, uh, including the comings and goings of its many bosses. Reporting their hasty departures quickly, accurately, and with an analysis of the implications for the BBC is one of the hazards of the job. Three of the last four BBC chairmen uh, have left before their time. Sir Christopher Bland resigned to become chairman of BT with no prior warning at all. Uh, this was a scoop for Jeff Randall, who was then the BBC's business editor. He broke the news on the Today programme shortly after the stock exchange opened. But unfortunately, he hadn't warned anybody else. And uh, the BBC is so competitive within itself that today hadn't bothered to tell anybody else either. So suddenly, I was being rung by Five Live and all these other places to try and stand up the story uh, uh, when he was already uh, about, to go on, about to go on the air. Uh, fortunately, I managed to get hold of the BBC's head of press, who was standing in the press office next to the chairman, ready to confirm the news. Unfortunately, um, it hadn't hit the stock exchange wires when it was meant to. And so, in fact, Jeff Randall went on the Today programme before it was broken on the stock exchange, uh, which is against all of the rules. But uh, anyway, we scrambled around and eventually got that um, sorted. Another chairman was Michael Grade. He left one night to become executive chairman of ITV, the BBC's main rival, to the private fury of BBC executives and many of the great and the good. Uh, and this was another Jeff Randall scoop, though by then he was working for the, uh, the Telegraph. So again, I was scrambled at short notice to try and uh, uh, give instant analysis. And of course, I was then up half the night confirming it, writing pieces for the morning. Because, of course, the other thing about a correspondent is you're on the midnight news and then you're up again at six o'clock in the morning to be live on the Today programme. I don't know how many of you are awake at 6 o'clock in the morning listening to the Today programme, but uh, um, I'm very grateful for anybody uh, who is. I had one the other day which was really above and beyond the call of duty. There is a programme that many of you will never have heard of called Wake Up to Money on Radio 5 Live, 
which is at um, 5.45. Uh, and I can't even now remember what the story was, but um, when they rang up and said, sorry, we can't get any... It was a story that had broken at about midnight. And uh, they said, we can't get anybody else. And I said, you really owe me uh, for this one. A quarter to, five, a quarter to six really is uh, above and beyond. Um, so that was another one. And then the third chairman to uh, go before his time was, of course, Gavin Davis, um, who resigned following the Hutton Report, uh, which criticised the BBC uh, and all the um, uh, follow-up to the Andrew Gilligan story about sexing up uh, the weapons of mass destruction report um, uh, about I Iraq. Uh, he resigned, um, again, even quick, more quickly than he intended to do, uh, because he told Andrew Marr, who was then the BBC's political editor, that he was going to resign. Andrew Marr, good hack that he is, immediately rushed onto the BBC News 24 channel to announce this fact, which meant that Davis actually was then forced to resign before the governor's meeting that was meant to be happening that evening. So he'd got um, a plan in prospect, but then he couldn't actually chair that meeting because he had already announced his intention to resign. So uh, that would have far-reaching consequences because the following day, the Director General, Greg Dyke, went too, forced out by the other members of, of, of the governors. So that left the BBC leaderless and me rushing from studio to studio to explain as best I could what on earth was going on and what the implications were. Uh, so again, it's um, an interesting job uh, at the best of times. Um, one silver lining was that, the B was that BBC News was widely acknowledged to have handled that whole Hutton story uh, fully and fairly without trying to argue the BBC's case. And I think this is one of the fundamental things about the BBC, um, that because it's publicly funded, publicly owned, it ought to be objective about its own affairs, about its rivals' affairs, uh, in a way that I think commercial um, broadcasters and newspapers find it very hard to. There's no reason why they shouldn't, but they find it very hard, uh, and they ought to try, they ought to try uh, harder. Um, I thought I'd give you a flavour of also the pace when a, a news story is breaking, because particularly in the digital age, when you've got news channels um, wanting the news all the time as quickly as possible, um, and you've got rival channels within the BBC all expecting you to be there, it can be fairly, it can be fairly frantic. Uh, and this was the case over the infamous uh, Jonathan Ross um, brand affair, uh, when you may remember uh, that they got into huge trouble over their phone calls to Andrew, Andrew Sachs. Uh, and indeed, the control of Radio 2, Leslie Douglas, eventually resigned, and Jonathan Ross was suspended. Uh, and what was happening, and this was before the days of Twitter, so now it would be even more frantic, but uh, what you get is reporters waiting outside for something to happen. So there are meetings going on. Uh, and uh, there was a particular meeting between the BBC Trust and the corporations uh, and the Director General uh, of the BBC, Mark Thompson. And he emerged that afternoon into a scrum of cameras and microphones to say that an announcement would be made later on. Uh, and in a well-ordered world, you might think that the BBC would manage this in time for its own bulletins. Um, but unfortunately, this involved several people's livelihoods and there were complex personal, legal and regulatory considerations. So five o'clock came and went, which is always the busiest time in broadcast newsrooms. The BBC News Channel, Radio 4's PM, Radio 5 Live's Drive programme are all on the air. And of course, they all want to break the news first. They want instant analysis from a correspondent. You've got the flagship TV and radio six o'clock bulletins being prepared. And with the best will in the world, I could not physically be on all of them at the same time. And I still had to write a script for the Radio 4 bulletin at six o'clock. I'd already drafted a holding piece that could happen, that could uh, run if nothing much happened, it depended what it was. But this would be out of date if a significant announcement emerged. So I offered to record another focusing on Leslie Douglas, a profile really of her, in case she resigned as Radio 2's controller, which meant that another reporter could then cover the announcement on Radio 4, which meant that I could be on, uh, on Radio 4 6 o'clock, which meant I could be on PM and 5 Live uh, as soon as the story broke. So 5.30 came, 
5.45 came, still no announcement. And you can imagine the tension in the newsroom was rising because this was a huge story about the BBC. And the last thing the BBC wants is for the news to be broken by a rival outlet. Um, so it was, it was fairly tense. And then suddenly, just before 10 to 6, an email emerged from uh, Leslie Douglas to her staff saying that she'd resigned. Then came a statement from the BBC Trust saying it was dismayed by the deplorable intrusion into the privacy of Andrew Sachs and his granddaughter, ordered the Director General to write personally to them, apologising on behalf of the BBC. And so armed with these two statements, I was able to rush into the PM studio for the last three minutes of the programme while an entertainment reporter rushed up to Five Live. Uh, and a few minutes later, a statement from the BBC management announced that Jonathan Ross was being suspended. And so I then raced up from PM to Five Live to take part in their six o'clock headline sequence while my Leslie Douglas piece was going out on Radio 4. Phew. Um, you can have the best story and the best analysis in the world, but that's no consolation if it misses its slot. I'm very happy to, in questions to talk about uh, the BBC and anything you want to know about Robert Peston or um, uh, all of those uh, different uh, things that people uh, like, to, like to ask about. Obviously, the digital world, very happy to answer questions about just how much life has, uh, li life has changed. Um, but I said to Susan, I would just uh, come up with some golden rules of business communication uh, as well, which I'm, I'm very happy to, um, uh, to share with you and discuss. And the first rule of business communication is decide who you're talking to, um, because business stories have all sorts of elements to it. It's one of the reasons that the BBC finds it difficult to cover business. If you're the FT, you know who you're talking to by and large. They're people interested in business. They may be in the city, they may be manufacturers, they may be doing other things, but you can, you can deal with them. If you're on the 10 o'clock TV news or the Today programme outside the, um, the, the, the business slot, you're talking to consumers, you're talking to workers, you're talking to shareholders, uh, you're talking to all sorts of different people. What is the story? Whose point of view are you giving it from? So first rule of business communication, decide who you're talking to and what uh, the issue is from that point of view. Because a story that's good for one will not necessarily be good for another. What's good for the workforce uh, may be bad for the shareholder, i.e. increased wages bad for shareholders because it's less profit, to put it at its most basic. Um, prices going up is not good for consumers, um, but it is good for shareholders, etc., etc. So you have to just be very careful how you are phrasing uh, these, um, th these um, stories and um, any communication you're doing. Keep it very clear and very simple. No jargon. And if you have to use phrases that do count as jargon, apologise for it and explain it and then get it into words of one syllable and things that people understand um, as quickly as, as you can. I always say to business leaders, get on the air, get out there, don't be afraid. Too many business leaders are afraid that they're going to be stitched up by the BBC and other broadcasters. And that may well be the case, uh, but don't let it stop you. Because actually, the people who do all these programs are incredibly forgiving of those people who are prepared to come and talk to them all the time. So Sir Martin Sorrell gets an incredibly easy ride because he is always there. When the results come out, wherever he is in the world, whatever time of day or night, he will be on the Today programme uh, talking uh, about them. Uh, Justin King of Sainsbury's. There are lots of others who are in sensitive areas like tobacco or fast food or unhealthy food, junk food as, um, uh, as it's sometimes called, who fear going on. And I just say, no, get out there. Once you've got over it, then you can talk and then you'll get your message across. And do the nursery slopes first. Go on Five Live. Do that wake up to money when nobody's listening and get the hang of it and so on before you try and do the Today programme and so on. Uh, and I think a few more business leaders are doing it, but not, uh, but not enough. Because otherwise your story just gets it doesn't get told, and your side of the story doesn't get told. So even if you fear you're going to be stitched up, have media training, get better at it, and, uh, and do it. In interviews, ask what the interview is for. Is it an interview where you might be accused of something, or is it just trying to find out what you're about? They want to know, they want you to explain what's going on. Try and work out uh, what that is. 
Um, and also, how is it going to be used? Is it going to be run as a full interview if it's not live, if it's a recorded interview, or is it for a soundbar? I know somebody um, who was um, coached in the one answer that they wanted to get across, um, and so just repeated this, whatever the question was, they repeated this answer, which was fine if it had only been a soundbite, but when it turned out to be an interview, it looked evasive, it looked shifty, it looked as though he wasn't answering the question, uh, and that man was John Burt uh, from the BBC on Newsnight of all um, programmes, but that's another, another story. Um, the other thing is, do talk to your staff. I mean, again, I'm talking to you as though you're business people, but I mean, these are, me these are messages that I try and get across uh, to business. Bring your staff into it. Your, your staff ought to be your best advocates. Uh, they aren't always in the BBC, I'm afraid. They are not uh, the best advocates for the BBC. A lot of BBC staff do not understand the workings of the BBC. Uh, they do not understand how well the BBC is doing. Um, and they are not advocates as if... Um, as they should be. Um, so it's, it's a message I try and get across to, um, to everybody. So as a Radio 4 presenter used to say, if you have been, thanks for listening. Um, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, and I'll just end by saying that if you'd asked me 40 years ago, I'd never have thought that reporting business could be so much fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.